Welcome back, friends. Welcome back. We're back. It's a movie episode day. So yesterday we watched the movie, and now we're going to talk about it. And that movie is everything. Everywhere. All at once. Yes. That's a very accurate title for this movie. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like this movie was everywhere, trying to be everything all at once. Oh, we have like one piece of business. It's relevant. We got a suggestion on the suggestion form from somebody we don't know. <laughs> this is a milestone, you guys. I'm Woo-hoo. so excited. I'm having so much fun celebrating these ridiculously tiny milestones. <laughs> um, not tiny. No. Whoever suggested this, I'm not implying that you are small or that your opinion is small, just that it is a lot of fun to celebrate small steps. Um, And their suggestion was a really good one. And it was in the flesh. Do you remember that show? It's a British zombie show. It's like post-apocalyptic. And it's after the zombie outbreak when they figure out how to make them people again. I think so. Yeah, I remember a facility where they have like recently converted people. Yeah, we watched it right when it first came out. And the suggestion for mentioned season one and season two, and I got really excited because I thought maybe there was a season two I hadn't seen, but it turns out season one was like three episodes long and season Mm. two was quite short as well. So we have seen them all. They were wonderful. That is a really good suggestion. I was kind of hoping to do that eventually anyway. We can definitely move it up because it's one of those wonderful ones that's fun. Not fun. Not fun at all. It's good. Fun in that it's got zombies. And they're using the zombie metaphor, the zombie apocalypse, as a way of talking about a lot of other topics that are very timely for right now. So I think it would be a really good one to talk about. Okay. And I thought maybe we'd pause after season one of Forever Night and do it because it's really quite short. So we could knock it out, chat about it, and then hop back in with Nick. But in the meantime, we have everything, a lot of things all the things to talk about. So, hi, I'm Rachel. And I'm Matt. Welcome to the Strange and Beautiful Book Club. So unpopular opinion time because this thing has like 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. But we did not like this movie. Underwhelmed. <laughs> Underwhelmed is a good way to put it. I uh, distracted. Uh, this yeah. movie, this movie at an hour and a half long is a great movie. This movie at two hours and 15 minutes long is not a great movie. It's not a great movie. This movie needed to be tightened up somebody was so fucking in love with the hot dog fingers <laughs> that they just had to throw them in every 10 to 15 minutes and it just clogged the whole movie up right we kept having moments where i'm like okay this is building tension nicely I, i'm immersed like i'm here for what's happening and then hot dog fingers yeah do you know my exact words when that when the credits rolled at the end I said that was like two hours and 15 minutes of bad sex. <laughs> because you never got there. You never quite got there. You were getting there. You were on a roll. And as soon as, as soon as everything started to build exactly the way you wanted it to, something would get thrown in there and it would totally derail you. And you'd have right. to start some gimmick, all over. Some gag. And you have to start yeah. all over. And then it was harder each time you had to start over to get yourself back in. To get where you were going. And by the time we reached the actual climax, we were so fucking tired. You didn't care. You were just like, well, thank God. We finally got there and it's over. Jesus. 
That's exactly how I felt. Now, there were a lot of moments that I liked. Yeah, Michelle Yeoh, she earned her Golden Globe for this. Oh, yeah. Uh, and Stephanie Sue, I'm going to, Steph, the, the woman who played Joy. Both of them were phenomenal in this. I love Michelle Yeoh. I've loved her since Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which is a seminal movie in my childhood. Mm -hmm. And I love that we got all different sides of her in this. And she was brilliant. Absolutely. And a lot of the filming and a lot of the themes were really poignant and timely. Yeah. The acting was good. The chemistry was good. The concept was great. Great. A lot of the particulars of the plot that are happening to the characters and why, awesome. Yeah, great. Honestly, this is purely like an editing problem. Yeah, this is an editing problem. All the bones for the good for a good movie are here, but we've got so much filler. It is bursting at the seams, and it is tiring the amount of shit they tried to throw in this movie. For the sake of throwing For it in For the sake there. of throwing it in, in this movie. So there's a poignant scene at the very end, which was one of my favorites. When we finally see Wayland, uh, Michelle Yeoh's character's husband, he's kind of been a background character. He's sort of a hero when Alpha Wayland takes over his body. Waymond? Waymond. Waymond. Yeah, when Alpha Waymond takes over his body. But at this point, Alpha Waymond is gone. And we finally get to see her Waymond for the hero that he is, not because he's strong or because he fights or because he throws his masculinity around, but because he's just a kind man who understands that most conflict can be resolved if you just talk it out. And all he's trying to tell her is, like, just be kind. Love other people. Show them that you love them. And you can resolve this. Now, if we had gone from that discussion with Waymond straight into the cool scene at the end where she starts throwing googly eyes at people and instead of fighting everyone, manipulating the possibilities so that the best or the funniest possible thing could happen, that is great. That momentum is perfect. It's, it's fucking awesome. And then if we got through all that, we got to the part where we're saving her daughter and, well, letting her go and then convincing her that maybe she doesn't actually want to go. If we had gone through all of that without any fucking sausage fingers, it would have been really impactful. Right. But instead, right in the middle of this emotional crescendo, I have to watch somebody's sausage fingers come mustard in somebody else's mouth and it's ridiculous and it pulls you out completely completely and we were i'm like i am not enjoying this movie i am not enjoying this movie there were parts where it started to become enjoyable and then immediately they just crammed stuff in it if you had cut out 25 to 35 minutes of this filler you just tightened everything up it's great i don't know why it has 98 percent in rotten tomatoes this feels like one of those things where it got overwhelmingly positive reviews and everyone was like well i don't want to be the one because i was reading through the reviews on rotten tomatoes and there were some blatantly negative reviews like one person described it as exhausting and overstuffed 99 percent uh Hold what? on. Hold. <laughs> you know, it goes the other way, right? Like one time my mom ran out of gas because she thought the needle went down. Or the needle, like when it was pointed down, the gas gauge was full and it was pointed up, it was empty. That's what it felt like. You do know it's not 99% bad, right? It's 99% good. I'm not saying it's 99% bad. I'm not saying this movie isn't, it's, an, it's a good movie. Is it? The movie it could have been? No, not in my opinion. And I know I just want to like, I just wanted to like this movie. It's gotten so much hype. And then we watched it and it was just like, meh, well, that wasn't as great as I was hoping it was going to be. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about it. it yeah. I feel the same. Green. <laughs> Super green. Super green. Okay. Uh, so let's 
talk through the movie and uh, yeah, talk well, about what we like. Let's just talk through the movie, and then I think we can we can pick out some more specific things that we enjoyed and then less enjoyed. So we're following two characters, um, Evelyn and Waymond, who fell in love in China uh, against her father's wishes. And so um, he let her go. You know, if you're going to marry this guy, you can't be here anymore. You got to go. So they went to the United States and opened a laundromat and had a daughter named Joy. And it takes a really long time to get this basic story out. Right. The be- the lead up for this Movie it's like 45 really minutes slow. before we even know who these people are. Even the op- the opening was extremely he- hectic, which I was okay with. She's running around. She's pulling googly eyes off of things and throwing them. And she's got a whole table full of receipts. And you find out they're being audited. And it's New Year's. Oh, Chinese. And her father's coming to visit. Yeah. And he hasn't met his granddaughter yet. Well, her daughter, yeah, and he's there and he's asleep and he's going to be up soon and she's got to have food ready for him and then her daughter is coming and blah, 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 blah. And then there's customers and they want their stuff and there's just, there's a lot happening. There's a little bit of um, like sexual harassment that happens to her in the laundromat, which is played for laughs, which I didn't love. Um, there's that guy that keeps telling her that her perfume reminds him of his wife's old perfume, his dead wife's perfume or whatever. Uh, uh, anyway, so we set up an immediately fast momentum, like a rapid momentum, which would have been fine if from there the pacing changed or if it felt relevant later that everything was so hectic at the beginning. But right. it doesn't because we never really change this sense of purposeless busyness that just permeates the entire movie. So they're going to the IRS uh, because they're being audited. And so um, Evelyn's father wakes up and it's Gong Gong, who is James Hong. Who of we course. Just, who just, else? Who else? We just saw James, um, except we've time traveled 30 years into James's future because in China, in uh Cherry Blossoms. Yeah. It's 30 years in the past. It was filmed in 1992. This is 2022. But it's James Hong, and um, he actually looks exactly the same. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, he's, he's amazing. I love James. Um, but they take him, even though he's visiting, they take him to the IRS with them. Right, and he doesn't know what's happening. He doesn't know he what's doesn't happening. Really speak he doesn't really speak English. And Evelyn speaks English, kind of. And Joy was supposed to come to translate, but Joy showed up with her girlfriend, and they had kind of a confrontation. And instead of calling Joy's girlfriend Becky, her girlfriend, to Gong Gong, she called Becky. Very good friend. Yeah, Joy's very good friend. And Joy was upset and angry and justifiably mad So we're at setting mother. up this tension where the yeah. mother has a lot of expectations and tries to force a lot of things on how her daughter behaves. Well, I think it's more that she perceives yeah. a lot of other people's expectations for her and that she's well, always right. trying to meet them, but she's just so frazzled. She can't meet anybody's expectations. She's letting everybody down by trying to not let anybody down. So they go to the IRS and we meet Jamie Lee Curtis. And Jamie Lee Curtis is Deirdre, who's their IRS inspector. And we get kind of a, I don't even know what's going on in the scene. She's telling them about deductions and blah, 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 blah. It doesn't really matter. Right. I think it's supposed to be just background gibberish. Yeah. On the way up in the elevator is our first interaction with the idea that there is something more going on. Because Wayman gets taken over by somebody. Right. And this somebody is also Wayman, but it's Wayman from the Alpha universe. And so he tells her, gives her a sleep, slip of paper. And on it is written a set of instructions. Well, before that, he gives her like a crash course. He puts the headphones on her. Yeah. And then she kind of sees her whole life. And you see this smartphone. It's like mapping out her life path. Yeah. And and then he's he kind of gives her a crash course on what's going on. Right. And here's instructions. Yeah. And I'm not going to be this me anymore. Yeah. Don't, don't tell me, don't talk to me about what happened, whatever. Right, which here's the plot beat where we have to have denial. 
which goes on for like mm, two to three days of real time. I feel like I started the denial. I started Evelyn's denial on Wednesday and it didn't end till Friday. It was so fucking long. And she's like, oh, no, 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 this isn't really happening. This isn't really happening. And he gives her a slip of paper and he's like, okay, whatever. Well, just do exactly what this slip of paper says as soon as you get to the desk. Okay. And so she takes the paper and she's sitting there and she's got these two like Bluetooth headsets, the old school, like talky Bluetooth headsets in her ear. And she finally pulls out the paper and it says like, switch your shoes to the wrong feet, picture the janitor's closet and then push the green button. And so the, the IRS thing isn't going well. And so she does it. She switches the, her shoes, pushes the button and she ends up like, we see a split screen. Right. She she's in one world and the in the closet. other world. And so she's being sucked into a, he calls it a burner universe, which we never. He never explains anything. Yeah. More we about don't explain that. what makes in one universe any less valid than any other universe. I don't know. It doesn't really matter because it's so hectic. You would have missed it if you tried to explain it anyway. But he basically tells her that. There is an alpha universe where an alpha version of her invented the ability to body hop, to mind hop, by switching their consciousness between different universes. And this enables them to access skills and memories, and uh, the way that they get from one universe to another is by performing bizarre actions that are statistically unlikely to happen on their own. Right, and they have an algorithm that predicts if you want to connect to the, a particular universe, yeah. here's the random thing you have to do. Right, because every choice, every decision branches the universes and creates more universes. So he calls it a froth, I think. It's like a anyway, bubble in the of froth. Lots of hand wavy mumbo jumbo. Blah, 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 blah. And uh, then there is a uh, supervillain. Of course, there's a supervillain named Jobu Tupaki. Which one of the actual funny parts is that Michelle Yeoh can't get the name right. Right. Yeah, th I think that's very I well identified executed. strongly with this aspect of her character because my mother can't get anything right to save her life. In fact, we have a bird bath that she uses to store keys and mail and whatever in the house. And she calls it the fishbowl. And nobody even corrects her anymore. She tells you it's in the fishbowl. You just go to the bird bath and get it because she's never going to remember that it's the bird bath. She's always going to call it the fishbowl. So the the idea that this woman just can't get Jobu Tupaki because she goes, oh, you're just making up sounds. <laughs> I was Mike for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Matt yeah. was Mike. <laughs> um, so it, it was fun. I mean, that that was pretty funny. And there's another joke later with the uh, Rakukuni. Yes, yes. Ratatouille. Like Ratatouille. And <laughs> Joy's like, you mean ratatouille and she's like yeah yeah rakakuni <laughs> which uh one of the funnier gags there's actually a rakakuni like, universe a universe yeah. yeah um then that one's fine that one's funny i'm, I'm happy with every time we see that because that's kind of a funny right that yeah anytime that's put in it feels okay it's a well-developed right. funny continuation of a previous joke right it's a good like beat that we hit over and over again and i'm ha i'm fine with that one um, anyway, so Joy, uh, is Jobu, which we, we, we figure out pretty much immediately. And it's that Alpha Evelyn at one point pushed Jobu, her version of Joy, to mind hop too much. Cause she was so good at Cause it. Cause she was so good at it. And it splintered her mind and she became everyone everywhere all at once. Every version of herself in every right, she universe. fragmented. Right. And she can kind of combine possibilities so she can do anything that's happening in any other universe she can sample whenever she needs to. Right. And then she can actually swap things between universes too. Right. And it works a little bit like um, in The Matrix when the, uh, like, Agent Smith can take over anybody's body. Right. Except if everyone was Joy, kind of. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's the same body. So if she harms a joy in this universe, she's harming the joy in this universe. She's not harming her consciousness, but she's harming somebody right. else's body. Which gets a little, we gloss over this. Right. We gloss over the human impact of all of this body hopping and damage that is done to people. Like you're, you're hurting yeah. and 
maiming and killing actual people. There's a lot of carnage. Like during the IRS scene, she gestures to some award. Um, Jamie Lee Curtis's character gestures to some award that she's won. And it looks like a butt plug. It is. I think it's supposed to be. Right. Well, yeah. okay. That was pretty funny, I guess. For the, We laughed. We right, laughed. Right, right. Ha-ha, the, uh, the, the butt IRS plugs were funny. Is whatever. Okay. Later, one of the statistically unlikely things that somebody has to do is shove one of those up their ass. So somebody ends up jumping off the top of a desk and landing on it from like a height. And then there's a fight scene between two guys who have trophies rammed up their ass. And I just don't. It was like bad slapstick comedy because my mind was like, well, this is an actual universe. These are people. And at this point, people from the alpha universe have like invaded Michelle Yeoh's universe. The, right, to catch Jobu. To catch Jobu. Or, and Evelyn. And yeah. Evelyn. Um, and to convince Evelyn to destroy Joy. But these are real people whose mind get taken over. Because Waylon, Waymond gets taken over quite a few times. And he'll just wake up somewhere randomly and he'll be like, oh, they, they took control of my body again. Which is horrifying. Right? Objectively, it's horrifying. The idea that somebody from another universe could take over my mind at any point, pilot my body to go do something and then leave, and I would be stuck with the consequences and have no memory of what happened is horrifying. But this is supposed, I looked it up and I saw that the description or that Michelle Yeoh had won the Golden Globe for being an actress in a comedy. And I was like, oh, what comedy was she in? It said everything, yeah. everywhere, all at once. And I was like, holy shit, this is a comedy? This- yeah, for probably the first half, we didn't quite grasp that this was supposed to be a comedy. Like a co- I thought maybe a fantasy with humorous elements. Right. I didn't expect it to be a comedy because it wasn't that... It wasn't the kind of funny that I would have expected a comedy to be. And I don't know if that's us being out of touch with What's funny? But it felt like those horrible 90s, you know, like the 90s, I, I early 2000s movies. I was thinking Ace Ventura movies. level humor. Yeah, like Ace Ventura, yeah. like um, even Austin Powers or like some of the early Adam Sandler movies, like Little Nicky and Billy Madison. Right, the like absurd humor. Yeah, the absurd, gross. It felt very Ace Ventura, uh, Ace Ventura right? Like when he used to lean over and talk to people with his butt cheeks, that was the level of humor that I felt what we were getting from the trophy up the ass scene. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. I was trying to peg down like where I'm, this isn't funny. and I can't figure out why this isn't funny to me. Um, yeah, I was just thinking maybe we were out of step, but I don't think so. No, I, I think some, whoever was, Cutting the movie together was. Uh, if sausage fingers know. aren't a fucking clue <laughs> of the level oh of God. maturity that was involved in the writing of this movie, you know there was some dude that every time they put that in the script, he was like, <laughs> "Sausage fingers." <laughs> That's what it felt like. Yes, to me. Yeah, yeah. more sausage fingers. I know. Anyway, so Evelyn has splintered. I mean, other shit's gone down, but does it matter? There's like, for every five to ten minutes of plot, there's 45 minutes of fight scene and ridiculousness, which Michelle Yeoh, as usual, is fucking brilliant in every fight scene because she's beautiful and capable and an amazing actress and an amazing physical actress. So she must have had to go to a chiropractor after this movie for carrying the entire fucking weight of what made this movie amazing. Well, her and Stephanie, her daughter, her daughter yeah. in the movie, Stephanie Zoo, but Sue, it's H S U. How would you say that? Sue. Sue. Yeah. So anyway, that was my, I just, okay. I can trying to like contain the, the need to just, just, 
Okay, but. so they're at the IRS. Yeah. Uh, she goes to the jail. No, she's at the splintered alternate now. universe. She's splintered yeah. now. And so now she is a multi universal, multi. Well, we, we kind of jumped because. Yeah, we did because in, so in the, little happens in there. So in the, the burner universe, yeah. Jamie Lee Curtis's character shows up to yeah. and kills both of them. Yes. And um, Alpha Wayman's like, it's okay. This is just a throwaway universe. Doesn't matter if they kill us here. And Jamie right. Lee Curtis. So then they go back. Is, well, her character has a black circle stapled to her right. head, which is our first indication that there's something happening. Which is, which. Uh, is reminiscent of the black circle that she wrote on the receipt that she was asking Evelyn right, about. And then there's some statues that we get a it recurring a theme yeah. of black circles. Um, but a lot happens in this IRS building. We're there for a really long time. Like a really, really, really right, long so they, time. Right, so they leave Jamie Lee Curtis's desk. They're at the elevator. And Evelyn has just seen alternate universe Evelyn yeah. get killed by Jamie Lee Curtis's character, Deirdre. Yeah. And then Deirdre is leaving, is like walking toward them aggressively, waiting right. at the elevator, and she punches her, she yes. punches Deidre, and causes this whole drama, and that's when Alpha Wayman shows back up. Yeah. And then we, he's like, okay, I'm going to get us out of here. Right, and he beats everybody up with his hip pack, his yeah, fanny, the fanny pack. pack. Yeah, okay, I that was a really funny scene. when he. Yes. It was very Jackie Chan. It was very Jackie Chan, yeah. yes. In fact, the whole time I was watching it, I thought, oh, this is some old school Jackie Chan where he would just improvisational fighting. improvisationally yeah. beat up everybody with literally anything that was around him. Uh, so I did like that scene. And he has to eat chapstick to get those skills, right. which was a little ugh, gross. <laughs> and then the next set of skills that he needs, he eats the gum off the bottom of a desk. And then he tries to get Evelyn to say she loves Deirdre. Right. He's this like, is your, relevant. This your comes thing back. is... Uh, I, well, I, so he's like, to get you, there's a universe where you are a kung fu master. Our universe. That's where she's a kung fu master. Yes. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> that was genius. That yeah. was a genius move. Yeah. So, and she's actually in the theater watching this movie. Right. In our universe. Yes. So yeah. that, that was really good. But she has to tell Deirdre that she loves her and she has to mean it. She's like, well, I can't do that. So she just says, I love you, and then pushes the button, but it's incomplete. She doesn't quite do it right. And so that's when she ends up as the, what does she end up as there's, there's the sign thrower that we go back to all the time. I don't remember exactly. Well, she ends up not getting the skills that she needed. Right. Um, oh, she just ends up in like the version of her universe where they just went home. She didn't punch Deirdre. They just left and went home. Right. They're either sitting in the car or she's home at the office. Yeah. And she's just found out that Wayman wants to, div wants a divorce. He served her with papers. And so that's, she's trying to fight Deirdre and live in that timeline at the same time. And she does end up saying, I love you. She works it out. She says, I love you to Deirdre. And she gets access to that part of herself, um, that universe where she has Kung Fu skills. And she like beats her up with her pinky. She like flexes well, her that's, pinky. Well, that's her a different one. a bicep. There's a different universe where... She's trained as a martial artist, except yeah. only her pinky fingers. <laughs> right. The, your pinky. Uh, Which, whatever. Okay. okay. Um, uh, so she gets some kung fu. And then she ends up needing to get back to that universe. She gets out of it. And they're fleeing again. Something happens. And she needs to get back to that universe. And she tries to say, I love you, and then push the button again. But it's not the same each time. And right. so this is when she ends up in sausage fingers. Right. Which, this is this the, is the only time it was it's funny. funny. Yeah. Because she's sitting there with floppy hands, trying to use her floppy hands to fight joy. Yeah. And then we're, we cut over to, okay, hot dog finger universe. Right. Okay. We have a bit about that. And then it's funny. Yeah. That, right? that was funny. Uh, the only other time I think it's relevant but, or like useful for the hot dog finger universe to come up is when she's pinned down and she has to use her feet. Right. Right. And then, so she's like, you have to appreciate every, all the good things, even if they're happening in bad situations. And even in a universe where you have hot dogs for fingers, you just get really good at using your feet. Yeah. Okay. That's actually 
like productive for the plot. You know what it reminded me of? Do you remember Salad Fingers? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like, like spoons. I like spoons. <laughs> Do you have any rusty kettles? <laughs> oh, oh, it's from the dark ages of the internet. <laughs> oh, God. Race <laughs> cut the line. <laughs> God, Google salad fingers. <laughs> not when your children are around. Um, yeah, not like we did. No. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Anyway, so shortly after that, she's hopping, 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 trying to just gather whatever skills she can get to try to. She's decided she doesn't want to harm Joy because they end up in an office and um, Joy is there. And Joy's not Jobu. She's just Joy right now. Well, right. she was but Jobu. But at any moment, she did show she up could and be she Jobu. was Jobu. And then she turns back into Joy. And so. Um, Wayman is regular Wayman. Joy is regular Wayman. And she thinks Gong Gong is regular Gong Gong. But it turns out he's like super Gong Alpha Gong Gong. Alpha Gong Gong. And so he gives her a box cutter. And he's like, you need to end it now while she's distracted. And so Evelyn realizes she doesn't want to harm Joy. She doesn't want to harm Jobu. Because in any universe, whatever incarnation she is, she's her daughter. Right. And so this at this moment, she realizes... The, the human factor yeah. in this whole body swapping thing. And this is this is a good example of how this movie could have been amazing. Because this is an amazing, this is a really poignant, really soulful, really emotionally impactful um, storyline. Yeah. This is a mother. Absolutely. Who, because she is so overloaded and she is so overworn by the expectations of others, she has failed at showing her daughter how much she really loves her. Right. And because she wasn't accepted and because she doesn't know what real acceptance looks like, she hasn't been able to accept her daughter for who she is. And so in this moment, that's what she's trying to do. I realize that this daughter, my daughter, Joy, I I love her. And whoever she is and whatever she's done, I don't want her to go. I want to try to fix. I want to try to fix this. I want to try to fix us. Right. In our I'm not going to kill this joy to hurt to prevent a different joy, right? From doing bad things, right? So, but now we got to go. Now we have to see um, the alternate universe where she's a maid and she finds out that there's, there's a, a sex secret. Dungeon. There's a secret sex dungeon behind Gong Gong, and that she can get back there and. I just, (laughs) every time, two hours and 15 minutes of bad sex. That is what this movie is because we were so close to having a real moment. And then they just ripped it away from us. Right. And then they threw in, oh, there's a room full of sex toys. Right. And she has to like lick a And a guy into BDSM. Right. She has to like lick a flail. Right. In order to move to her next whatever, which turns out to be a blind version of her. Who's a singer? Uh, uh, the blind and the singer are two different. No, ones. they're the same. That's why she has her eyes closed the whole oh, time. Okay. Um, and so she, whatever, is blind, and that's because there's smoke. And so she has good lung capacity because she's a singer, and she doesn't need to see because there's like tear gas. And she's also a sign thrower, so she grabs somebody's shield. Shield riot shield, yeah. Defeats everyone with the riot shield. And anyway, this whole scene goes on for a really long time. And we just do a lot of hopping and a lot happens. And if we try to break down every little bit of thing, we're going to be here forever. So we go through all of that. And then we get back to where I was R- saying she. But she realized that she had to become like Joy yes. in order, or, or Jobu, to save Jobu. Right. And so I, I called this a little bit earlier. I was like, oh, like Jobu, Joy has traveled through so many versions of herself and experienced the same rejection from her, all the versions of her mother. Yeah. I was like, her mother's going to have to do the same thing, fracture herself, and then basically like uh, reconcile yeah. each Evelyn with each Joy right? in order to reconcile Jobu. Right. Which and, is what she does. And so that's basically her strategy. Yeah. She's like, okay, I have to become like Joy to save Joy. I'm going to do that. I'm yeah. going to sacrifice I'm going to potentially sacrifice myself. Yeah. 
but not just this version of myself. I'm going to risk every version of myself for the sake, for the small chance at rescuing every version of my daughter. Yeah. And here's another moment where we almost had it. We almost had it. She realizes that this is it. This is, she's going to be the one to save her daughter because she has found within herself the capacity to hop to all of these different universes, embody all these skills, and then learn how to exist in all of them all at once. And she finds out that the reason that she can do that is because she is the biggest failure out of every she Evelyn. She is the worst Evelyn. She is the worst Evelyn ever in any universe ever. She and, is living the worst timeline. Yeah. And because she has not fulfilled any of her potential, she has limitless potential because she's never used right. any of it. It's just been sitting right. there. She has attempted like the most. Miles. And so they made a reference to this in the IRS audit meeting. They're like, oh, you're a singer, you're a chef, you're a caterer, you're whatever. Like yeah. Just listing off all these you know, hobbies, Yeah, as Waymond calls it. And it's like, because she always fails at things, she immediately tries another thing. Yeah. And so this version of her has attempted the most quantity of things. Yeah. Which caused branching universes at very close proximity to her where she became successful at those things. Right. I thought that was really clever mechanic. And, and the line where they're like, you have the most potential because you are the worst version of you <laughs> <laughs> is is a comedic line. Yeah. Right? It's psychological, it's comedic, it's ironic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When you frame it like that, I'm less mad at it. Less mad. At that one part. At that one part. So as Evelyn is learning to embody her new multiversal self. Jobu shows up in Alphaverse and kills Alpha Waymond. So he takes she takes away um Michelle's Evelyn's um tie, her tie to the the original universe. Except for Alpha Gong Gong. Oh, except for Alpha Gong Gong, but Waymond was the one who was most closely associated with her. And Wayman is the one that she loves, and she's with him in almost right. Every and she universe. was, she was falling for Alpha Wayman, yeah, because she's like everything that I want my Wayman want to my Wayman to be. Yeah, this guy is he's a badass. Yeah, and my Wayman he's soft and he's just nice to everybody, and whatever. Right. And so Alpha Wayman, her hero, like the man she's like refalling in love with, dies, and then she's like, oh shit. And and then Wayman, her Wayman wakes up and she's like, oh, this dude again. Yeah. So Alpha Wayman has passed away and he was sort of our false protagonist. We felt like he right. was going to see us through this movie. He was going to guide Evelyn because up until the point where she loses him, she's really sort of useless. Like right. at one she's point, dependent on him. Yeah, at one point he says, are you going to fight or are you just going to lay down and take it? She goes, I think I'll just lay down. She actually just lays down and he picks her up and carries her. It's a lot. And once she does become fractured, she sort of becomes unmoored in reality. And right. so she has to feel out the new parameters of Evelyn. And one of the things she tries to do is physically fight with Jobu. And, of course, this doesn't work because Jobu can simply just sample from any possible reality at any given time. So when Evelyn punches her, she pretends to be hurt, but then she's like, oh, stop it. And Jobu just starts laughing. And she's like, actually, I don't want to fight you. I want to tell you about this thing that I made. But she told her about it earlier, but we revisit it in this moment, which is this thing that she's created that everyone is afraid of. And it's the reason that there's chaos and sadness and horror in the universe right now, more than usual. 
The reason that your neighbor doesn't talk to right, you. The personal sense of despair that everyone feels. Yeah, it's it's the reason for the zeitgeist of our era being predominantly negative. And it is the everything bagel. Seriously, I would have been okay if this wasn't a gag. If she had just found a way to create a hole in reality and it was eating away at all possible realities, that would have been fine. And the everything bagel thing is funny. But once you've thrown so much shit on the pile, it's hard to even process what is funny and what isn't supposed to be a joke anymore. And so this is a bagel on which Jobu, at one point in the past, in the future, in the wherever she exists, put everything on it. Like, everything. And reality imploded. So she created this hole in reality. Right, like a black hole. And she's been seeking Evelyn, not because she wants Evelyn to fight. She doesn't want to destroy Evelyn or harm Evelyn. She wants Evelyn to go with her into this hole so that they can leave reality together because nothing matters. Which, this is one of my biggest pet peeves, is the idea that given the perspective of the entirety of what is real, someone will immediately assume that nothing matters. We did the same thing in Paul. I otherwise really liked Paul, but the first time, you know, remember they meet the ultra religious girl Mm -hmm. and Paul does the like head, head, butt knowledge transfer. And she gets all of this knowledge of the universe and immediately nothing matters, which is, Okay, I clearly don't have all the knowledge of all of reality, but can we come up with something more creative? Maybe. Right, it's a fairly shallow, like <laughs> philosophical. And it doesn't trigger. make any yeah. sense. It would be entirely dependent upon the personality of the person that it happened to. I fully believe that Joy, when presented with the idea that everything is trivial because every decision the consequences are are so much to process that nothing matters. Nothing matters. I can see Jobu doing that. And for a certain extent, when we first meet Evelyn, I can understand Evelyn being like that too. This is just a generic take. Rachel's take on the, guys, if you're writing a story in which a character is gaining knowledge, gaining some kind of infinite cosmic knowledge. To the point that they have an existential crisis. It doesn't always have to have a negative result. It, it doesn't. My, why can't you have the character that when they find out that absolutely, that there are no real consequences, there's no external force driving you to be a good person. Just because there's no external force driving you to be a good person doesn't mean you're not going to be a good person. And it's, ugh, ugh. But we kind of do clear that up because faced with the idea that nothing matters. Evelyn's like, well then fuck it. Fuck all of it. And she just goes on like a nihilistic rampage. And she's just, so she just ruins her situation. Yeah, She's carpet bombing every reality. She's driving Wayland away in the reality where she didn't go with him. And she became this beautiful, successful martial artist, actress. And she's, Fighting with Wayland, she's just Waymond. She is just literally destroying all of her lives all at once because who cares? So she's in her reality, which isn't really her reality. We're supposed to assume this is her home reality. But in her home reality, didn't she punch Deirdre? Isn't that her home yeah. reality? This is the reality where she punches Deirdre, where Deirdre shows up. Well, in with the, the in the reality the, where she re- punches Deirdre, that's the reality where she's trapped in the IRS building fighting everybody. Right, and they escape. They don't escape. She dies. That's the one where she vomits and passes out in the dirt. 
That's that. That's that reality. So this is the reality where she didn't punch Deirdre and they go home. This is the one she accidentally goes to when she says to Deirdre that she loves her, but she doesn't mean it. So this is the reality where they just went home. Okay. Um, and so she's angry. She breaks the window with a baseball bat. She's just on a rampage. And this is where we get a really meaningful, heartfelt moment from Waymond. Not Alpha Waymond, but Waymond, Universal Waymond. Waymond, Waymond. in every reality, is talking her down from the ledge and telling her how much she means to him. And even in the reality where they're both very successful because they weren't together, he says, I would have been just as happy with you running a laundromat And doing taxes. And doing taxes. And so it's this really nice, really heartfelt moment from this just kind, gentle guy. Right. And he's not naively kind. He is intentionally kind. Yeah. And it's the idea that not every male character has to be over the top to be the hero. That I'm... It's okay to have a softer, kinder, more grounding male character. And that, I loved that. Uh, That was one of the moments in the movie that I really emotionally connected with. Probably because Matt is a lot like that. Um, Yeah, I relate to Wayman. Yeah, you relate to Wayman. Not in the, like, I don't railroad you. The fact that I talk more in the podcast aside, I don't railroad you in the way that Evelyn kind of steamrolls over Waymond all the time, where he's trying to cheer her up by putting googly eyes on everything, which is a total Matt move. Mm -hmm. And she's just taking them off and throwing them at him and screaming about no more googly googly eyes. I thought I told you no more googly eyes. And he's just trying, and he's dancing with the customers, just trying to make the best out of out of everything that's happening. And she has the first of many epiphanies. We had our epiphany that nothing mattered. And then we have an epiphany that more matters. <laughs> I don't know. And in the in the midst of all of this, Jobu kind of takes her on a tour of all of these bizarre realities. We get more sausage fingers cuz of course we get more fucking sausage fingers and we get our rock world which is probably the most meaningful conversation that Joy and her mother have in the entire movie. Yeah, that's probably the best scene in the entire movie. Which fits, because that's how Matt and I fight, too, is over text. (laughs) (laughs) Because it's just easier to conversate that way. And so Evelyn has this epiphany and decides to follow Waylon's advice. Wayman. Waymond. God, why is that so hard? Because Wayland is a name I know and Waymond's not. It's like Raymond, but with a W. Right. Waymond. So Evelyn has her, she doesn't really have an epiphany. She just listens to her husband for five minutes, which she hasn't done at all in this entire movie yet. And she realizes that, oh, maybe, maybe more matters than I think. Maybe fighting joy isn't the answer. Maybe what I need to do is use kindness and love to heal the universe, which is another theme that I am 100% behind. But it takes us, we have Wayman's speech, and then it takes so long to get to the point where she is implementing what he's trying to tell her that I almost forgot about Wayman's epiphany that he shared with her and she's getting ready to fight all of these people and so instead of actually physically fighting them she starts doing ridiculous stuff like they shoot bullets at her and we get the like matrix bullet right in the forehead thing and then yeah she starts to throws the bullets back and they turn into googly eyes and when she goes to slam two people together instead of slamming two people together uh they kiss and become like Married. married couple which okay great yeah let's just go ahead and negate free will while we're at it let's that's kindness right would you rather i beat you up 
Or would you rather I force you to fall in love with someone you weren't previously in love with? Well, we're at the we're at the end here because this is this of if any of this movie had like a well put together, concise, meaningful, emotional moment, it's at the end here when she's finally ready to have a real conversation about her emotions with her daughter. Mm -hmm. And it's because Jobu is getting ready to enter the bagel. And she wants Evelyn to go with her. And so Evelyn is fighting up there to stop her. Right. And this was one of the biggest scenes where I was getting pulled in. I was in it. There was a really good kind of... I could tell that something good was about to happen. Something big was about to happen. And it was working. And then... Hot dog fingers. Orgasm denied by the mother hot dog fingers. Um, we even got the cool revisiting the rock scene where the she's like, oh yeah, she's, she starts to move the rock, and Jobu's like, you can't move the rock here, and she goes, there are no rules, and the rock. Like, turns you just and told me nothing matters. There are no rules. Right. Right. Okay. Well, then I'm going to move this rock. Yeah. Which yeah. the what Jobu says when she first kind of is talking to Freed, like temporarily freed Evelyn is I was kind of hoping that you would see something that I haven't seen that you would, you would be able to answer what really matters. You would be able to find the one thing that I haven't been able to find that would make all of this make sense. And she kind of does, which is it's okay if it doesn't make sense. She even tells her, I don't care if nothing makes sense and if nothing matters because I want nothing to make sense and I want nothing to matter with you and I want to be together. And so she's holding on to Jobu, to Joy, to keep her from going into this bagel. And Joy says, you have got to let me go. Because as this is all happening, stuff is all happening in all of the concurrent universes at the same time. And it's exhausting. It is exhausting. We could have cut it down to the two main universes, which is the one where their actual life is playing out and the one with the bagel. And that would have been great because we would have been getting that conversation we needed to have at the beginning of the movie, which was, Mom, I just want you to accept me and I want you to not be ashamed of me. And we could have the bagel thing happening. And we could have flip-flopped between the two of those, and it would have been impactful and meaningful. But instead, we're cutting between, like, that world and the actress world and the world with the bagel and the sausage finger world where Evelyn and Deirdre are together and they're reconciling. And Deirdre's playing a soulful melody with her feet on the piano and then they're sticking their sausage fingers in each other's mouths. And it's it cheapens the ending so much that it, as time goes on, I'm getting more and more upset about it because this I hate that I was denied I that I didn't feel like this movie had the emotional impactful like emotional connection that it could have had simply because of like probably 25 to 30 minutes in total of screen time of this one little skit that they just couldn't let go. And it harmed the movie overall. And it would have been so easy to just eliminate it, but they kept it in because they wanted this to be a comedy instead of just letting it be a surrealist fantasy. If they had framed it as a surrealist fantasy with humorous overtones, it would have been so much better. But in the end, of course, she lets Joy go, because Joy asks to be let go. But then they both realize that they need each other, and that she doesn't care that Joy hasn't amounted to anything yet or that she's a mess or whatever. None of that matters because nothing matters. It just matters what they mean to each other. And so we get kind of a happy resolution where everybody in all of the different universes um, pick themselves back up, get it, get their feet back on the ground. Even Rakakuni 
who part of her scorched earth policy was getting the raccoon picked up by animal control. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So she lets the chef drive her after the raccoon. Uh, That one was actually pretty funny. Even, I don't know. It, It was funny. But... Yeah, I mean, that's the end. They love each other and they're a family and they're trying to just be a family in this one universe, at least for now. And that's the end of two hours and 15 minutes of bad sex. Um, So I think we've already talked about what we thought would make this movie better, which is just cutting, cutting a whole bunch of the... Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good material there and it's mostly... There's big chunks of it that are all in the right order. You just have to take out the parts where you're like deliberately interrupting it for a slapstick gag. Yeah, and I think if we we kind of condense our slapstick into places where it makes more sense, it's funnier. Right. I don't think I would have been as mad at the trophy up the butt joke if I hadn't just had to go through the BDSM joke. And the sausage fingers joke, and the raccoonie joke, and the we had so many running gags going, all at the same time, and it was so hard to keep up. Like Fleabag, which we watched, is really funny. It's immensely funny, and there is one overarching running gag through the entire two seasons, and every time you see it, it's triumphant. It's hysterical. And it's the statue. It's just this stupid statue. But because of the way they have peppered it throughout the series, every time you see it, even if it's not doing anything, even if you just catch a glimpse of it in the background, it's funny. It's hysterical. It's like the monster theory, right? Like if you're having a horror movie, you can't reveal your monsters right out at the beginning. You can't. Because if you throw them out right at the very beginning... You've got nowhere to go. Right, you need to gradually disclose yeah. the monster. There's no build. A there's bit no at or- a time. There's no monster orgasm there. You just you start out at the top and you just got to maintain. It's a stairway, that. not a cliff. Yeah. So I feel like if we had picked a couple of strong gags, if we had not thrown so much in all at the beginning, and we'd let it all build. It's so much more humorous. It's so much funnier. It's so much better. I mean, I can see why it won awards. I get it. The acting is great. Everyone in it is stellar. I read an article with Jamie Lee Curtis about this movie, and she said it was so liberating to be in a movie where she didn't have to suck in her stomach. And I thought that was such an interesting way to look at it. But everything about it is, I mean, all of the acting, of course, I don't argue with the awards that it won for acting at all. I just don't get the hype about the plot. There are funnier movies out there. And there are deeper movies. This felt like it was trying to please so many people all at once. It's like the new Marvel movies. There's so much fan service and just... People pleasing. Right, and it becomes very generic feeling. That it it doesn't feel remarkable. This didn't feel like one person had a vision and created a work of art. This felt like we're going to try to make a movie that everybody can find something to love in, and they'll all love it because there's something in here. If we put enough in this movie, everyone's going to find something that they like because there's so much shit in it that, that for sure they're going to find something. Which we just watched another movie, which was similar in that over the topness. The absurdity. Absurdity. But it was a masterpiece. And that was Mandy. And you can take whatever you want about the fact that we fucking loved Mandy and really struggled with everything everywhere all at once. And you can just analyze that however you want to. I, I I'm not I'm not I'm not throwing that in the psychoanalysis machine. I'm just going to let that spin on its own. Um, But it was beautiful. And we're going to do it on the pod. And I think we should talk about the the 
the two absurdist movies, this one and Mandy, and really what worked in one and what worked and did not work in the other. Because, I mean, on the surface, these should be similar. There's a lot going on in Mandy. There's a lot going on in this one. Neither they're one both is, very surreal. They're both very yeah. surreal. Neither one's grounded in reality. Both of them have the same sort of, there's only, there's a limited number of sets. All the action is literally driven by actors in and out and plot elements. Um, but Mandy worked and I didn't feel like this one did. I also want to point out that the one with Jet Li has the inverse plot of this one. Right. The, it has the inverse mechanic of how the universe works. Right. So in the multiverse, the fewer of you that exist, the stronger you are. As opposed to everything, everywhere, all at once, where the more universes you exist in, the stronger you are. And one is everything, everywhere, all at once. And the other one is the one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and has better dialogue because I am you law, I am nobody's bitch is um, it's Oscar worthy. Best person. finishing line of the movie. Yeah, best finishing line of a movie pretty much yeah. ever. Um, yeah, so that's, I, I feel like I said a lot about how I felt about it. Did you have anything, like any observations you really felt like I missed or you wanted to throw out there? No, I, I tried to, I tried to cover everything um, that I felt comment worthy. Yeah, and so we're sorry, Ryan. Ryan suggested this movie. And I really wanted to like it for you, Ryan. I really did. But I think we're about 45 minutes in, and Matt and I were just sitting there silently, and I went, I kind of don't like this movie. And Matt goes, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I, I I don't know. I've been pondering it all day, just trying to decide, like, what about this movie made me feel so frustrated. And I really just think that it was, um, I mean, it's, it's all in editing too, which just drives you crazy because if you just had someone with a, a slightly more critical eye, if your editor had just been a little bit more, a little bit harder on it, and we'd cut this from two hours and 15 minutes to, I don't know, probably an hour and a half to an hour and 45, you'd have a tight, nice, concise, well-paced movie. And I don't know, the two-hour movie... Some movies can be two hours and you don't feel like any time's passed. And some movies are two hours and you feel like you watch them for days. Like I always feel like Schindler's List is like eight hours long. I know it's not. It just feels like it takes an entire day to watch it because it's so dense. And this felt long for a different reason. I think because the pacing was like a slinky. It would like stretch and then compress and then stretch and then compress. But the stretching and compression didn't make sense. And right, and you ended up with the gags in the middle yeah. of the stretching or compressing rather than in between the stretching and compressing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we agreed to skip awards this time, although if I had one, it would be most overused gag, and that would be the hot dog fingers. Yeah, I, I would probably have an award for hot dog fingers, uh, but it would be really negative. Yeah, I... Uh, also, if you have a world where people have hands, non-functional hands, their world doesn't look like our world, but with where you use everything with feet, that's ridiculous. You'd have an entirely different society. You've had entirely different technology. All of everything would be shaped differently. The entire way that you interact with the world would be different. It wouldn't just be our world, but where you use your feet. Anyway. <laughs> I can't turn it off, okay? I'm watching this movie like, what? This is terrifying. I know, I've been fending you off all day. (laughs) (laughs) I know Matt's had to bear the brunt of this. Um, Okay, I'm sorry. All right, I'm going to try to shut it off. I mean, I'm not going to shut it off forever because, I mean, that's why we have a podcast is because I literally can't stop thinking too deeply about movies. And you want other people to have to suffer the way you suffer. (laughs) <laughs> I, I wouldn't put it that way. Uh, endure the way you endure. Participate in the wonderful <laughs> conversation. Participate. Okay. That's fair. Participate the way you participate. <laughs> okay. So, had a few minutes, like a day, calm down. 
And now we all know why Rachel says, no, I haven't seen it. Every time Kate asks me if I've seen a new television show, because if I see something that I think I'm going to like and I don't like it, I really go through like the five stages of grief. Yeah, you you really can't let it go. I can't. And so you guys caught me um, on anger, but I have moved on to um, acceptance. So I feel like we can talk about it a little more. Uh, nuance now. Plus, my like angry ranting caused a shutdown in Matt.exe. <laughs> so I had to wait for him to restart and he had to go build stuff, use tools for a little while. And uh, now he's back. So uh, in on that note, would you like to start? Have you pondered it at all today? Probably didn't even cross your mind today, did it? Not really. I mean, how do you do that? <laughs> I just let it go. Uh, it's an ADHD superpower. I oh, oh, well, I don't have that. Um, I have the other one where you can't let it go. And that's my <laughs> superpower. <laughs> and that's why we work so good together as a couple. Yes. It is. So I'll start us off, and I feel like you'll probably just react because. Yeah, I'll just riff off whatever you say. That's how we do. Uh, so my my revelation today um while I was thinking about it was uh, this feels like, so just to preface this, I, I'm not gatekeeping artwork. I have a degree in art. I have worked as an artist for a large part of my life. So I'm not saying that any type of art is more valid than any other type of art. I used to make and sell coffee cups and I definitely think of that as art. But that being said, to me, this felt like the artwork that I see now that I'm on Instagram and I get bombarded with reels all the time where people make these like agate things where they drip resin and then they add crystals and it ends up looking like, um, what's that thing where you break the rock and there's like crystals on the inside? Geode. Geodes. Geode artwork. It ends up looking like that. It's beautiful. It certainly takes skill. It matches your couch. It fit in any Yay. room in your any room in your house. But it doesn't tell me anything about the artist, except that they're highly skilled at what they do, which is an art form in and of itself. I'm not saying it's not. It looks cool, but there's no message. There's no message. It looks really nice, but as a way of exploring human interaction and as a commentary on something in an artist's life it wasn't there and that's what it felt like to me this movie would match my couch but it didn't change my life um and i did look up some negative reviews i went on rotten tomatoes i scrolled through the like seven pages of reviews for this and i found a couple of negative reviews and it seemed like literally just a couple like three <laughs> And I, it seemed like everyone that didn't like it didn't like it for the same reason that we didn't like it. And one that I found that I really resonated with me, um, and it was it was from Cinemascope by an Angelo Meredid. Meredid? I don't know. I wrote it in my handwriting, so... I can't read it, um, but it's from Cinemascope. And one of the quotes that I really liked was, um, what they haven't done is found a way to consistently temper their Barnum-esque showmanship when the material at hand calls for sensitivity rather than absurdist non sequiturs. Yeah, so they really, that sounds right. It's about exactly what we were saying is they just didn't know when an edit was required. When I wanted to live in that emotion for a minute and not have a gag thrown at me. And I also looked up the directors and there's two of them. They're both named Dan. So they call each other. They, they're uh, known as the Daniels. And the other thing that they have directed, almost the only other thing that they have directed is Swiss Army Man. Ooh. Which fits because Swiss Army Man is about a corpse farts and he somehow saves this suicidal man's life by being a corpse that farts a lot 
We watched approximately 25 minutes of that movie. Maybe someday we'll revisit it, but um, uh, yeah, I could see their hand in both of this, both that and this. Um, I also learned that Waymond is short round from Indiana Jones. Oh, yeah. Ryan made a comment to me about that. Yeah. I was like, holy shit. How did I not see that? So oh, I'm so glad he's back. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that also, um, Yo's role, Evelyn's role, was originally written for Jackie Chan. Oh. Yeah. Uh, that would be it. I don't know. I don't know that I would. Hmm. Hmm. It'd have to be a completely different movie. Yeah. Because I mean, you the, could do father love thing, but that's as right. much as this emotional bid is done. The emotionally distant father bid is far more done. Right. Far more done. And so, I mean, I'm not saying you can't like this movie. In fact, Kate loves this movie. And was shocked. And sh- was shook. That shook we did That we didn't like this movie. I was yeah. also shook I didn't like this movie. But, which is probably why, well, no, it's not. That's not true. That happens every time I don't like a movie. You guys can look forward to that every single time I don't like a movie. But she's coming uh, for our usual book talks with Kate. And we're actually going to have a in defense of everything, everywhere, all at once episode. And so Kate is going to act as our person who loved the movie because she did not an act. She really did like it. In fact, she called me because she was so shocked that we didn't like it. And so I'm excited to hear what she loved about it. And she had some ideas about why we might not have liked it um, above and beyond our what we've already discussed. And so I'm interested to hear that. And if anybody else really loved this movie, I would love to know why. I'm happy to be convinced uh, of the redemptive qualities because this is universally loved. And I'm not saying it doesn't have qualities that could definitely make it something that people would universally love. I just didn't love this movie. And since I'm in the minority, I would love to know why. Convince me. Don't be mad at us that we didn't like this. I want to know what you, what other people loved about it. Kate asked a question, which I thought was an interesting question, which was, are we too cool for school and we just don't know it? Uh, Which I thought was a really interesting question. Are we like gatekeepers and unaware of it? Is it something where, because we were discussing, I asked Matt the generalized question, has there been any blockbuster movie made in the last five years that we universally loved? No. <laughs> There's been some that I liked. Yeah. But like the Marvel movies, probably about two thirds of them I liked. And. Yeah. So that's yeah. something we're going to be talking about with Kate because I really kind of want to unpack what about cinema recent movies is it that I so strongly feel disconnected from? And in some ways, Matt feels disconnected from as well. Yeah, I was thinking maybe the cultural humor is shifting. And because we're not keeping up with all the latest stuff, we've gotten left behind. I don't know if it's that. Uh, I think it also might be we like the middle of the road passion projects. The, I loved a thing so much, I had to make it to share with other people. And the money, of course, is necessary, but also incidental. So I'm the 30 to $50 million budget movie that I expect to make a little bit in the theaters and then make all of my money in release, in streaming and physical media. And that's dead. That whole genre is dead. That whole middle of the road, just like the middle class is gone. That's all gone. You either have your indie films or you have your huge blockbusters. And so we have never really connected to large 
to the blockbusters. And it's also a little bit survivorship bias, right? So the movies that we love from the 80s and 90s are the best movies from the 80s and 90s that have continued on through until now. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of movies that were released in those, mo- in those years that were released and then disappeared. And we don't see them. We don't comment on them because they literally have were they didn't stick around. And so of course those movies seem better because we're seeing the best of what was of what survived. Which brings me to our podcast idea when we split the pod, which I haven't quite done yet. We had a hectic week. But one of the things we want to do is forgotten movies. Movies that were great but maybe weren't, they weren't the kind of movie that everybody keeps watching now, but they were good, they were fine, or maybe didn't deserve to be forgotten. Maybe they were marketed incorrectly or whatever. Um, just as like a, a fun archaeological dive into what's out there that we haven't seen from times gone by. So that's going to be our kind of our, we have a name, but we're workshopping it. So this is just another teaser for the pod split, um, which is coming eventually. But I just wanted to end this podcast on a kinder note than the last time we recorded it. Um, I'm sorry, that's just going to happen. It's going to happen every time I don't like a movie. I, I'm (laughs) Matt's smiling at me because he's, he's weathered the storm usually on the way home from the movie theater with me just shouting in the passenger seat about how I felt. And now everybody gets to hear my passenger seat rants. So you're welcome. So I started a podcast, but I guess we'll just, we'll end it here. And then please come back for the in defense of this movie episode with Kate. And if you have anything you want to share about why you loved it, feel free to DM me on Instagram. You can just comment on Instagram or you can email us at the hosts at strange and beautiful dot club. That's a real thing. The hosts at strange and beautiful dot club. Remember, sometimes the strangest things are the most beautiful too. So be who you are and love what you love. Until next time, friends. Bye. Bye. something uh, no just cables oh thinking about cable management right now i'm thinking about cable management right now <laughs> I'm trying to talk to you about this in the movie i'm thinking about cable management where was i going with that